as art depicting the mysterious creature known as Bigfoot grows in popularity. Research around the nature of Bigfoot has been changing. Changing from looking for an elusive hominid or great ape to looking for evidence that Bigfoot is something alien or paraphysical. Even the stars of the two best-known Bigfoot series on television, Animal Planets, Finding Bigfoot, and the Travel Channel's Expedition Bigfoot, told us that they know, but were not allowed to show in their series, that Bigfoot is something beyond the reach of consensus science. It was about a, a five-minute deal where we were, we caught something on the flare. It was very, very large, two or three times the size of a person. And then in time, something much smaller, about the size of a person, walked up to it. And then the smaller one continued on behind it and up the hill. And we've got it all recorded on therm. We don't know what it is. I've seen orbs out there when I've been squatching. Uh, I was actually with Renee, who on the show is a skeptic, and she was standing right there. We were, the whole production crew were sitting there watching these two orbs just bounce along. They ended up, we measured it later, they were 70 feet from us, going walking pace. And uh, the um, natives tell me that when they travel sometimes, that's how they travel in their spirit form. It's like a ball of light. And they may or may not still, like people say they're cloaked or whatever. I don't know if that's what's going on, but I'm open to it for sure. The Native Americans talk about them having, Sasquatch having one foot in the physical realm, one foot in the spiritual realm. And people are experiencing these things kind of phasing into our reality and phasing out. Uh, and people also talking about um, them having this ability to cloak or go invisible. And we've experienced this uh, on the show Expedition Bigfoot. I believe we captured footage of this. Um, and what's amazing is what was edited out of the, the show from the network is me talking to it and saying, we know you're up there, show yourself. And moments later, it walks across. We can't see anything. Our flashlights create this shadow-like puppet on the rock wall. And the shadow on that rock wall, I see hair. And it walked like the Patterson Gimlin film for like four or five steps and then just disappears. Join us as we explore the possibility of Bigfoot stool nature, no pun intended, with one foot in the physical realm and the other in the supernatural realm. A dual existence reflecting our own physical and immortal nature. To be upfront, both the producers and directors of this short film have had visual sightings of paraphysical Bigfoot. Alan McGargle had his looking out a window of the Adobe homestead on Bradshaw Ranch, just after the film crew entered the building. When they looked out the window, there was a black figure crouched down. And I blinked a couple times to see if I was really seeing that. And when I when I when my eyes refocused again, it was closer and then it like it was left right left right and then it just was gone so after i described what the creature looked like to jurgen he pulled out his phone and he showed me a picture of what he had captured and as soon as i saw it i i recognized that that was the creature the thing that really struck me was the the shape because what i saw was very very boxy, almost like its head was in front of it. And that's exactly what it looks like in Jurgen's picture. So I was, I was in disbelief. Uh, that was the moment that I realized that I had seen Bigfoot. Ron Meyer had his visual sighting of Bigfoot near this Ute spirit tree in Bailey, Colorado. And so we walked over to the tree. I got my hands on it, my eyes are closed, and I presume yours were too. Yep. And I looked over like this, and I went, oh my God, here's his shape. Big shape, typical Bigfoot, head, shoulders, standing probably a foot and a half above you. And, and then you, so it was separated by, you were kind of waffling like, you know, the old kind of 
break up static electricity. You know, you see sometimes on television where the figure's not quite there and it's coming in and out of existence. And obviously my brain is trying to figure out what the heck this is. And eventually it was like, okay, there's a creature behind him. He's waffling in and out. Um, your, your eyes are still closed. And finally I say to you, hey, Alan, there's a creature behind you. Tom Powell was one of the first to suggest that Sasquatch is something more than just a primate belonging to this planet's biological lineage. Right now, I think there's a lot more people than ever before who are willing to entertain the idea that the Sasquatch is one member of this uh, community, this uh, collection of creatures that, that all operate on the fringes, the margins of, of human existence. A lot of people think that we are in fact being observed from afar by various paranormal entities which have an in interest in humanity, which have an interest in what's going on here on planet Earth. But two summers ago, I went out into uh, an area in Washington State that's considered to be very active with uh, Bigfoot. And I went with two investigators who took me to some of the private locations where they had had some very dramatic experiences. And as we were walking along on the trails, uh, I became aware of something following us. And if I turned around fast enough, I could catch a glimpse of something big and brown. Uh, on the trail behind us and it would vanish very quickly. I do believe that Bigfoot is interdimensional and that they have paraphysical capabilities such as a sudden disappearance and cloaking themselves. They can make themselves invisible if they want. What really interests me are some of the weirder aspects of the Bigfoot phenomenon where people have claimed to have seen these creatures and they've sort of vanished in a flash of light or they've literally just almost dissolved or they've been seen in conjunction with strange little balls of light flitting around the woods, sort of the size of tennis balls, maybe sometimes the size of a basketball. And the, the creatures have been seen in a, almost exactly the same location and the same time. And, you know, the, the ability of these creatures to um, elude us 100% of the time and with 100% successful rate as well, no other animal other than these so-called cryptids uh, are able to achieve that. In fact, the paraphysical aspects of Sasquatch or Bigfoot are part of indigenous people's cosmology and experiences. Experiences portrayed in this 800-year-old rock art, depicting a Bigfoot holding up a deer for the natives. And in the lower right corner of the rock panel, is a signature Bigfoot print. To, to us, there's, they could be spiritual, they could be physical, you know, um, they could be dimensional, universal, or they could be just right here, physical right on earth, you know. And so they don't got, to us, they don't got limitations like we do as, as people because they don't got the same mindset that we have. We're taught that we can only go grow so far and, and then all of a sudden you gotta stop. You can't go above it. Where to them, there's no such thing. It's, they can go wherever they want, whenever they want, however they want. The question can now be asked seriously. Why do Bigfoot often show up in well-known paranormal hotspots including Skinwalker Ranch. And then there is the remarkable correlation between Bigfoot and UFO experiencers. In our research study of UFO contactees, which was comprised of 4,350 individuals, we determined that approximately 22% of them had Bigfoot encounters. I can tell you I had many people in this room where we're in right now teaching remote viewing classes, several over the years that told me of their Bigfoot experiences over lunch, during breaks. And I did not know how for the longest time how to fit that into any sort of box in my mind because I, uh, 
I had heard so many researchers of this topic say that it was an undiscovered primate. And I had listened to Coast to Coast Art Bell since the 90s, since I got involved with remote viewing. And I sort of put it in that category of a very rare ape, very rare primate that I would probably never see. So every time I encountered the subject, and this is how strongly you can be influenced by people you've listened to and who you believe. Every time I heard stories about this, I would immediately just think, a oh, very rare animal. It didn't quite make its way into my mind as a very important topic until I started hearing about the phenomena that uh, go along with Bigfoot and Sasquatch cryptid encounters. Time slips, battery camera failure, uh, orbs, balls of light. Lyle Blackburn is a longtime author and investigator of cryptids and Bigfoot. After many hours in the field, and analyzing reports of Bigfoot encounters, his assessment of what Bigfoot is has been changing over time. For me, you know, when I, when I was young and I first approached this subject, of course, you're just looking at it as someone saw a Bigfoot. They saw the Loch Ness Monster. And you think of it in terms of it, it's a you know, Loch Ness Monster is a plesiosaur, a dinosaur. It's just a terrestrial, Thing. Bigfoot, you know, is it the quote-unquote missing link? Is it a type of uh, hominoid or great ape that that we haven't discovered that's out there? So you you know that's sort of with just the default approach. Um, as you go, of course, you're exposed to other possibilities, and people put in, you know. I mean, they play in all sorts of things. UFOs, are they aliens, extraterrestrial? Um, are they coming through portals, um, interdimensional creatures? Do they have supernatural ab abilities? Um, are they not so much biological as a phenomenon that we don't understand? So what does it mean that Bigfoot and Bigfoot encounters might be something paranormal or even interdimensional? Colonel John Alexander has been the lead investigator of a number of government and military parapsychological programs, has written and lectured on UFOs, and was one of the early researchers at Skinwalker Ranch. He describes the fundamental mysteries surrounding cryptids, including Bigfoot. What's the most problematic about the, in cryptozoology uh, is the temporal relationship in other words, they appear and then disappear and have some interactions. Uh, for instance, at the ranch, uh, Skinwalker Ranch, where we had several, they run along and then you see the tracks and then they just disappear. And of course, the question is, where did they go? And I don't think that's even a useful question but it does get into multi-dimensional realities. And in my view, what happens is that these overlap from time to time. And while they're coincidental, it's just as physical as you and I sitting here. And then when those realities separate, they're just gone. Ufologists have pointed out that the classical alien being, the greys, a weakling humanoid-like being, which for us humans are just scary enough without being terrifying. The same could be said for Bigfoot. They're big, but familiar. Reports say they come in all sizes and colors, often appearing as shadow-like figures seen out of the corner of our eyes. Just enough familiarity that when they appear to us, it is said that they are out of place and surprising maybe even scary at first. Uh, about six years ago, um, I was, me and two other guys were cutting firewood on uh, the Santee Dakota Indian Reservation in Northeast Nebraska. And um, it was early in the morning, like 8.15, by 8.20, and we all got our chainsaws ready and we all went to these different jaws of trees to start cutting down these dead trees. And I looked up because I felt something staring at me. And behind this big giant 20 foot cedar tree, I seen this, um, I, I caught a Bigfoot, but it was clear. 
it was uh, shimmery. You know, you could see through it, or you know, but you could still see the outline of it. And so at that time, it scared the heck out of me, and I immediately laughed. And I told my friends, let's get out of here. And so we left. And um, ever since that time, from six years, even you know up to today, um, I, I, it usually comes around when we have our ceremonies. Usually uh, sweat lodge ceremonies, uh, sun dance ceremony, or UEP ceremonies. This footprint not only has dermal ridges on it, um, it matches a morphology not like a human. It's not human. It has a very broad heel, very flat, flexible foot, what looks like a mid-tarsal break where it can bend in the middle. As for hard evidence of Bigfoot's presence, researchers point to the thousands of casts of footprints and unusual tree structures, such as these that are said could only be achieved by extra human strength and manipulation. And they're like uh, all wrapped around. <laughs> Another big part of the traditional search for Bigfoot has been to interact with the creatures through an exchange of vocalizations. <laughs> Cries and whoops that are initiated by the investigators. Sometimes a reply is heard and even recorded. Okay, this will be the juvenile now. This is about one o'clock in the morning. There's three of us and there's absolutely no one else around that we're aware of. One such recording was made by Tobe Johnson at a paranormal hotspot called the Owl Moon Lab, south of Eugene, Oregon. You want to hear a Bigfoot sound? OK. But for over 50 years, the most compelling evidence that Bigfoot exists are recordings of vocalizations recorded in the 1970s, recordings known as the Sierra Sounds. Recordings captured at an isolated hunting camp in the high Sierras between Yosemite National Park and Lake Tahoe. The ecology of Moorhead's hunting camp area was dominated by mixed coniferous forests of ponderosa pine and Douglas fir. Punctuated by granite rock formations and a mixture of mammals, including black bear, and mule deer. A few years ago, the camp succumbed to a wildfire. But back in 1971, it was pristine wilderness when Al Barry and Ron Moorhead arrived. Immediately, strange things begin to happen. Bigfoot beans come around our, our campsite up there, eight miles in the wilderness, by the way. And 8,400 feet in elevation, so you only get there in the summertime. The snow load's not so bad, but it's times when we go out of our shelter and, and me and another guy just got froze, just froze. I mean, you couldn't move, not cold-wise, just paralyzed. And that was strange. Uh, but that was just one of the strange things that happened at the Sierra Camp. You see lights and other things, too. One of those strange things were vocalizations never heard before. My emotional reactions was uh, not as fearful as you would expect, even though you were concerned. But we we're all hunters up there, and we had high-powered weapons with us all the time. So we were wondering if uh, they were going to come in the shelter at us or, or not. They were really making some aggressive sounds. So we uh, 
we didn't shoot at them. They didn't attack us, and uh, they didn't come in after us. So we became a kind of rapport being built there, and we started interacting with them and recording it, and had those recordings studied. So they can't be duplicated according to the professionals just listen to it. And then people say, well, I can make a sound like that. Well, no, they can't. They can't step on it with those voices like we recorded. It's inhuman. A lot of people believe that whales and, and dolphins, porpoises, can have some kind of a communication, uh, uh, oral communication, uh, out loud communication. One of the experts who analyzed the Sierra vocalizations was retired Navy cryptolinguist Scott Nelson. In fact, he traveled to the camp to experience the sounds personally. When I heard the Sierra sounds for the first time, in my classroom at the college, I I made three conclusions. The first one is that um, I was hearing a language without any doubt. That was before I was able to really study the sounds and, and transcribe them. I knew immediately from my professional experience as a cryptolinguist that um, I was hearing a language. <laughs> the, the second conclusion I came to immediately was that these, these creatures were not humans at least not by our modern definition of a, of a modern human, because they were making sounds that uh, I immediately recognized could not be made by human beings. in the upper ranges and in the lower ranges. Um, and they were doing things uh, with their utterances that humans don't do. For instance, they were articulating on the pant or the inhale as easily as they articulated on the exhale. <laughs> they were speaking as they inhale and, and exhale at the same time and which made the speed of delivery of their utterances way faster than humans are capable of and I mean there are other reasons why you know we know that they're not they were not human okay. um, and the third conclusion I immediately came to was that these tapes were not fake Going back to the hoots, howls, and growls often associated with the presence of a Bigfoot, Nelson also has an opinion about those. The hoots, howls, screams, snarls, things like this would not be, um, that is not really my domain. If it's not linguistic, then I don't really, I can't claim to be an expert on those. Some of them may have, a, you know, linguistic meaning, but um, growls and snarls, things like that, would probably have the same meaning to them as as they do in humans, with humans. As far as you know, a snarl I means you know, it's intimidation. But other than that, they would not uh, have. Um, linguistic syntax or meaning. Um, therefore, they're kind of outside of my domain. However, the Sierra sounds are very different. As Ron first put it, and I have always stated this in, in the same way, since he first put it uh, in this way to me up, up there at the Sierra camp, he said, Scott, there is way more going on here than we can possibly imagine. Because of all of the 
high strangeness. Things that make no sense in our physical, scientific world. And I've agreed, uh, I've always agreed with that. I think if you, if you imagine the highest strangeness you can, you have to go steps beyond that. It's way beyond bizarre. So, what produced those vocalizations? From our direct experiences up there, uh, you can no longer stick with this old idea that they're just a, a remnant gigantopithecus who somehow learned to walk on two feet and, by the way, learned to figure out how to, to uh, <laughs> evolve a tracheal tree and a vocal cavity exactly like our own because they in their uh, vocal articulations, they make exactly the same sounds in exactly the same ways as humans do. Yet using capabilities that humans don't have. Moorhead now agrees these were not produced by creatures that belong to our natural ecosystem and that they chose him to communicate a message to. What's the one question that I'd like to answer right now? Uh, 1974, when I was interacting with them in the Sierra camp, they were trying to ask me something, trying to say something to me. I wish I knew what it was. The cryptolinguist only transcribed, said it is a language by the human definition of language, but what they were saying, he didn't translate it. Until one comes into camp and says, ooga ooga, and points to a tree. You don't know that ooga ooga means a tree. <laughs> so you gotta have that. And if I had an open mind, like maybe I hope I have a little better one now than I did 50 years ago, uh, I might be able to understand what they were saying to me and uh, understand why they were doing what they're doing. As in the movie Arrival, perhaps, there's a message in the vocalizations, a message important to humanity from a non-human intelligence, a message that needs to be decoded. Moorhead has come to believe this is the case. I feel like I missed the message when they were talking to me back then. Uh, I just don't know what they were saying, and uh, that's unheard of. I didn't realize how significant it was until later in life when I realized, you know, these things are trying to, maybe something critically important has something to do with today. Maybe it's why I'm here right now talking to you. I don't know. Perhaps again, as happened in the movie Arrival, it will take someone like the movie's heroine, Louise Banks, a linguist to develop a latent paranormal human skill to understand the alien messages embedded in the Sierra sounds. According to Darwin, Darwin's theory, we evolved from the ocean on it through primates and into what we are now, but it does not explain uh, how we get the attributes that so much display, like remote viewing, telekinesis, telepathy, consciousness, that's the big one right there. Those things didn't evolve. I think those were given to us by, here we go, God. Now both Moorhead and Nelson agree that whatever produced the Sierra sounds are sentient beings, perhaps Bigfoot, with capabilities that humans are evolving towards. Capabilities that reflect many of the unusual properties of the recently revealed alien nature of the UAPs captured by the U.S. military. What I think is that we're dealing with something that is not very often in our reality and maybe the only time it is in our reality is when people see it uh, or see them and when we're not seeing them it's because it's not because they're hiding they're not behind behind a trunk or in a cave it's because they're no longer in our reality and i think the multi 
dimensional hopping or jumping, if you like, is the answer to why and how these things are so elusive. So what do these unusual contact experiences between aliens, Bigfoot, and us mean? You can do so much more as humans than what we are showing in our everyday life. We're, we're not evolving as quickly as we should. We're able to do things that we just are not doing. And instead, we're killing people and hurting people, and that's what we got to get away from. I think there's something really incredible that's happening, and I think I do feel like the veil is thinning. I feel like there we're, we're coming to this place of understanding and um, realizing that there's other realities intersecting with our own. The great quantum physicist Erwin Schrodinger said about the difficulty in understanding life, including us and alien life forms. We must not be discouraged by the difficulty of interpreting life by the ordinary laws of physics. We must be prepared to find a new type of physical laws, laws accounting for the mysterious qualities of Bigfoot.